welcome to the Video Simplified podcast where I help you simplify the video creation process to help you reach wider and connect deeper with the people that need you the most. From learning to use your camera to simplifying video strategy to help you grow your brand and share your vision using video. So let's jump right into today's episode. What is up entrepreneurs? Welcome back to the Video Simplified podcast with me, your hostess, the mostess, Diana Gladding. It's been quite a year for cameras, not this year, but it feels like 2021, 2022 kind of were can jumbled a little bit into one year, especially because releases that would have come in 2020 were a bit more staggered. However, one of the things that I find most interesting is the rapid pace that, you know, obviously you have research and development for cameras, but how fast they're able to really uh, put together a package of a camera that is so ideal that it would literally, literally, doesn't sound like much right now, but it literally would make me switch from an APS-C camera like the ZV-E10, A6400, A6600, and so on, even the FX30, as good as it is, to a camera like the Sony ZV-E1, the real big buff brother, <laughs> okay? Now, whether he got buff in, in the gym, or he got buff in jail, we don't know yet, but the big buff brother of the ZV-E10, and I'm finally switching to full frame. It's happened. Uh, and so this that's the camera that I'm gonna be switching to, as crazy as it sounds. Now, uh, if you watched any of the footage that has come out recently on the camera, this camera has a, a tremendous amount of features that are great, and some for some creators, you have to understand when you're watching content online. A lot of it is from photographers and videographers um, and then filmmakers. Difference between videographer and a filmmaker. Videographer is someone, they were doing projects or something like that. They're uh, doing remote producing, uh, things like that. So they may, you know, hold the camera, what have you, and get shots, you know, uh, as a speaker uh, and as an author, you know, at different times you're doing presentations and someone's capturing that footage for you. And so the difference between someone that's more or less in that filmmaker vein, there are film filmmakers that do videography work and vice versa. Some of it's uh, a little bit intertwined. The difference is a filmmaker is someone that's creating uh, content with an intent to create a unique piece that's maybe something that they came up with, they want to share someone's story or whatever. And again, the lines blur a little bit back and forth from one vein to another. Now, I personally don't identify with any of these categories now, as a filmmaker, while, while I may put something together that may tell someone's story um, or I'm very interested in telling a story on a topic, not interested in being a filmmaker because that's not going to be my end goal profession. It's not it's not a goal or something I truly, thoroughly enjoy, if that makes sense. Um, photography, videography work. At one point I did videography work. Now, it's just not something that uh, is the vein of work that I want to be in ultimately, obviously. Uh, and so I stopped at the end of 2019. That was this, I just went ahead and sunset that. So a real short time frame. And then photography work has never been my bread and butter. Can I take a nice snapshot where sometimes you have happy accidents? Sure, but that's not the thing. I am a coach. I am a consultant. I'm an author and I'm a speaker. And in the process of doing those roles and finding and uncovering my passion with video, I learned that uh, number one, I do a very great job when it comes to simplifying complex uh, ideas and making them easy to understand and not for the photographers, videographers, or filmmaker, while they are welcome to benefit from that as well, it is specifically curated for entrepreneurs. We usually have a business. We don't care about the photography or filmmaking world. Some of us cross over into being a little bit of a hybrid and you start to love it uh, or it becomes a very expensive hobby but most entrepreneurs, they don't care about it. They just need something that does the job. It's like picking tires at a specific tire shop for your car. You love the car. You love the vehicle. It helps you to get to where you need to go. Um, it's maybe part of a status symbol or something for you to, for some people. But the tires is not something necessarily like the rubber. It's not anything that you care about past the point of it doing doing its job. And for a lot of people, a camera fits into that vein for entrepreneurs as being a tire. It's just something that we need to work, that we use, that helps us transport this information of the what we have, what we do, to help us share our vision using video. And that's my goal and my aim with the work that I do. Uh, now, do I love cameras? Do I love video and what it makes possible? Absolutely. But 
what makes this camera different and why I'm switching from where I personally love uh, to create and the cameras that tend to fit my personal style uh, seems to and does fit my audience, my ideal target audience, fits the vein of content that they really enjoy. All the cameras like the Canon M50, Canon M6, M6 Mark II, uh, you have <laughs> the Sony ZV-E10, the Sony A60, all whatever thousands camera, were all APS-C sensor side camera, size cameras. And the way I always explain that between micro four thirds, uh, APS-C and full frame, which are the common three sensor sizes. And again, I'm getting a little technical, stay with me. We'll be all right. <laughs> micro four thirds, APS-C and full frame camera sensor sizes. Uh, I remember watching this stuff and it was frustrating initially uh, being a newbie. Somebody was trying to just figure out my first camera and which one to pick. People talked about sensor sizes like they wouldn't produce a good video depending on which one you picked and full frame would be the ideal one. But the other ones are kind of like backwards door processes or cameras that just weren't good enough. And eventually you should upgrade to full frame if you're serious. And that honestly is super disrespectful <laughs> to, you know what I'm saying? It's like, um, I, oh man, it's, it's so many examples I can use for that, but it's just super disrespect, disrespectful, honestly. And you have to be careful when you're watching content as well on YouTube. It's a lot of vitriol out there. And that vitriol in the camera space spills over from the sensor sizes to the camera brands, types of lenses, focal length. It just is like the worst kids that never got a whooping before a day in their life. No discipline whatsoever. Grew up into adults, got into this space and creating stuff. And some of them are super skilled and it's not the whole you know, like, but it's just, it's a very loud uh, minority because creators respect other creators. And I just don't see that uh, sometimes in, in the video space. But unfortunately, I hope that changes over time. I found a home with APS-C cameras, eventually, you know, trying all these different brands from Panasonic. Nikon was not really anything I ever wanted to touch. They never produced anything that was never enticing, nor did it solve my problems, which I believe all cameras should solve problems, not create them for you. And Canon and Sony did the best. Fuji was always cool. Uh, but again, they didn't have their autofocus nailed in. Still don't to this day. It's <laughs> great cameras, great features, amazing. Bees Knees Hall of Fame specifications on paper. Uh, and even when it's produced. But the what you don't see is what happens behind the camera. And how many times did you have to retake the clip before you share what you showed online? For example, it's no different if I gave multiple different takes of me doing something uh, to do a video and I'm only sharing the best one. Maybe it took me seven times to nail an introduction, but I'm only going to share the best one. So it's the kind of the same things become uh, with video. And that's what I learned in that process of uh, buying cameras and the whatnot and using them for myself. It's like, this doesn't pan out from all the videos that I saw. It's not panning out in real life. That's not uh, at least my experience. And then you, you know, talk to other people and it turns out it's like, mm, not quite, you know, what it should be uh, as far as transparency sometimes online. So as I became uh, a coach in this space, working with entrepreneurs, helping them simplify video creation, APS-C, again, it's like the micro four thirds, APS-C and full frame cameras or sensor size cameras. And the best way to remember that is micro four thirds. It's like having the small, if you go through a drive through APS-C is your mediums. And then full frame is your super size me. It's like your largest even. Uh, well, I won't say super size because there's my uh, medium format. Whole other conversation. But full frame is like a large. Sometimes you have a taste for a large. Sometimes everything may be needing to be a large for you. But sometimes you have checkers and rallies. That's what it is. If you're in, uni in the United States, you may be aware what, those, what that restaurant is. Where your mediums are like a large. But you have to order a medium but it's like a large for the portion size that they give you. Whereas other places, like you may see different clips on McDonald's, for example, they can pull the small, the medium, the large, all in the same cup. And it's like the same amount. So it's like, eh, <laughs> you know, choose your own adventure at that point. But my whole thing, I say all that to say this, when it really boils down to it, it doesn't matter what sensor size that you use, but there are these creative camera camps, if you will, where depending on the what you create or, or what have you, uh, there's limitations. All of them have amazing, any of the micro four thirds, APS-C or full frame have amazing, but it became a shift where a lot of brands moved into the full frame space because that is what 
when circa 2017, 18 on forward, you started to see the migration from you're not just a photographer, you're not just a videographer and a filmmaker. A lot of, you know, weddings, they want it both. They don't want to hire maybe sometimes two separate people, but weddings, that does make sense. Uh, but for some gigs, they don't want to hire both. They, they want to hire one person that can do both. And when the cameras made it possible for those freelance entrepreneurs in those spaces to be able to do both, they started making different demands to the camera brands. When I looked at what makes sense for the creative process for an entrepreneur, APSC fits the bill. It kind of doesn't matter what you want to use uh, at this point, but APSC most commonly fits the bill, but I'm camera agnostic when it comes to my recommendations, when somebody's asking something or they're, you know, asking like, hey, I need this, this, and this, now what would you recommend? It doesn't matter to me what the brand is. I'm looking and I'm filling the need based on what they're saying that they want or if they have a brand affinity and we find what works within that brand. But if not, then it's like, here's what my recommendations are. If you have been listening at any point to any of my content or watch any of the videos, you know, back in 2019 or somewhere or very early 2019, I switched from Canon to Sony, found a home with Sony cameras and still have, but still stay with APS-C. But the new Sony ZV-E1 has done something completely different with it's making me switch over to full frame. Doesn't sound like a lot other than maybe spending more money, but the features of what this camera makes possible is going to change the face of what becomes possible for content creating entrepreneurs. Granted, it will change for other brands because similar to the product showcase mode where you could hold something up to the camera uh, on Sony, Sony cameras and uh, just the fact of you doing that action, it would refocus on your face. Now, I don't have that setting on my uh, Sony a6400 and I don't have it turned on if I was using the ZV-E10. But what I find most interesting is that now every other brand is starting to introduce some kind of object. They find another word for it. It's like object focus mode or, <laughs> you know, something like that. Sony has made a lot of jumps in this space. They've, they've revolutionized when it comes to fast autofocus, uh, almost like 100% reliability with autofocus and have become the standard when it comes to exceptionally reliable autofocus, which is why it becomes my brand of choice personally and why it's the brand I recommend the most for content creating entrepreneurs. You don't have a lot of time. If you have listened to me teach on the content quadrant of being able to decide what videos you actually have time to create, being able to source those throughout your, your day uh, or in your week and even through the month based on your schedule, using the content quadrant, well, how many times do you want to retake because your camera's out of focus? Not at all, ever. Honestly, I, I don't want to. So I'm saying that because the new features like this AI auto reframing, for example, now we have cameras that for the most part, they all do a relatively decent job. And when you start going down the other line, say Panasonic, which is d done well with the S5 Mark II, which I'll maybe talk about a little bit, maybe not, <laughs> but save that camera. All the other cameras absolutely are horrendous when it comes to autofocus, no matter how much they've tried to improve it. So again, Sony became, Sony became the benchmark and the standard for setting that. This new AI technology, which is of course the buzzword of 2023, uh, <laughs> let me figure out what you're in, 2023. It's not just that. What happens now with entrepreneurs, you become more normal, normalized to the gear that you're using, come more comfortable with it. You become uh, more creative in the ideas because you're thinking my camera can do this. So what does that make possible for me? Or I've seen a video like this. I want to replicate it. How do I do that? Because a lot of times, some of the coaching sessions, when I'm working with a client, they're, they're going to send me an email. It's usually some kind of back and forth dialogue. And we're having a conversation. Sometimes if it's as simple as telling them a one, two thing of what to do, you know, it's completed in an uh, email exchange. However, when somebody really has like a vision or they get even more creative uncture <laughs> based off of what they see in someone else's content, it's like, man, I, I want to do something like that, but I want to add my own spin to it and do this. You know, we go through an hour session uh, on how to build that out, maybe an e-cam on how to adjust those settings in their camera and just on and on. It's very interesting. Now, here's the kicker. 
this new camera with the AI technology, imagine like a lot of people want to hire somebody, which is why we did the building a team course and go to building a team dot live uh, to get access to that. But sometimes simple things like holding the camera and having it follow you or trying to prepare for being on screen, reposition, reset up to get you to reach down and grab an item or to show a desktop mode and then to come back up and show your face and whatever again, that time it cuts into how much time do you have to record? How much time do you have to create? Sometimes not a lot. So those micro inefficiencies start to add up over time and very quickly and video content creation becomes even more of a time consuming beast than it already is. I'm all about systems and efficiency. If something is not done in a systematic process, I'm gonna look real quick and very quick for a way to do it. And if something is not efficient, I'm looking to see and find ways of what is, how's this gonna be more efficient for me. The ZVE one does that. With the auto reframing fe fe feature, it would automatically pan. So now, whereas you would have items like, uh, which, which is one of the things that allured me to the DJI, Osmo Pocket, the little handheld gimbal, but the autofocus sucked and it was unreliable. So I eventually sold it and got rid of it. And long before then stopped using it because it was just not effective. Or I've tried, you know, buying gimbals and gimbals work. Uh, they're a great piece of uh, gear, but it takes forever in a daggone day for you to, it's like, what the hell? So, or you put your phone on. So again, to have that panning down and put your camera. So you have your camera and you have your phone on top so it could see and work. And it's just like, what are we doing? <laughs> so it's adding more costs, more expenses. And then you're like, well, geez, Louise. It's like, you know, so then, then you got that. Or you get a GoPro, you know, strap it to your chest. Or, you know, it's strapped to your head or whatever. You got the mouth clip so you can do these things. All of these little extra buys disappears in a $2,200 camera. And the time it takes to redo, relearn, re-engage, get more accessories, and constantly it's like too many learning curves equal a circle. How many times are we going to keep rebuying, buying, 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 trying to fill the need? Because that's all it has been uh, available for us is just that clunky method. The ZVE1 solves that. Some simple feature, AI, auto reframing, super smart. Then these these Hall of Fame specifications, I don't want to run through all of them uh, right now, uh, but we'll put them uh, on the screen for those that are watching. But you have uh, 4K, 60 frames per second, 4K, 120 frames per second, 422, 10-bit. You have all kinds of, like I said, new unheard of features in the camera that, that we've never seen in other cameras. Never, 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 never. You also have the same sensor as higher end cameras like the Sony FX3 and the Sony A7S Mark III, which is the highest video centric camera that they have from like when they say you want the best Sony camera for video, that's it. A7S Mark III, incredible trailblazer of a camera uh, that a lot of people instantly is just like, oh man, I can do this now. I can make this now, whatever. Only problem was the price, close to $4,000. Between that and the FX3, same kind of thing. It's just a cinema, a cinema body style, same sensor, same specifications, uh, just different body design style, similar to the FX30. Kind of has like a built-in cage, if you will. And these are Netflix approved cameras. FX3 is a Netflix approved camera, which means they test how good it is to make sure it can survive all of the pushes and the pull in the image to do all of what it needs to online, all devices, and has a really, really long benchmark. If you ever go on YouTube, I would encourage you to watch what those uh, tests look like. It's extensive. It's like the Olympics of, of cameras when they're testing it to say, this is Netflix approved. But again, these are cameras that cost close to $4,000. I would hope that they are able to be Netflix quality, not just like re looks really good on YouTube and just looks really good in general, but it's Netflix approved. Literally became, I think, the gold standard when it came to streaming products. And now Netflix kind of didn't lost their mind with some of the updates, but I digress. But here, here's what I find most interesting. They put that exact same sensor, no stops. No, like no, they didn't pull any, any stops with it. So they didn't cripple it. They didn't make it worse. They put the exact same sensor, same specifications, small tweaks for some 
things for efficiencies to make it better and put it in a $2,200 camera. You literally are saving half the price almost, especially talk about sales tax and all that, depending on where you buy from. And it's $2,200 camera with AI technology that those cameras that are in the close to that $3,500, $4,000 range do not have for $2,200. 4K60, 4K120 frames per second, 422 10-bit, has all the bells and whistles that you could ask for. Microphone headphone port, HD, clean HDMI, 4K up to 30 frames per second, I believe, externally uh, through the USB. We saw USB streaming become a thing with the ZV-1 and ZV-E10. Uh, and to this date, those are the only lower end cameras price wise that Sony offers those in a 6400, a 61, a 6600 doesn't have that capability. You can always stream via HDMI, sure, but via USB. So you don't have to carry a capture card. You don't have to carry all these extra cables. Same one you use to charge the camera with. You can same, use that same one to stream with. And I've done that before and it works great, but there was a limit to what it could do. Well, now you have 4K30 for streaming via USB. Higher end cameras that Sony have that they offer that's supposed to be their quote unquote flagships don't have that. This week's Gear Fix is brought to you by my brand new book called The One Right Video. Are you an entrepreneur struggling to get your brand noticed through video content? Look no further. The One Right Video is the ultimate guide to creating videos that will amplify your brand and grow your business. It's jam packed with practical tips and strategies to help entrepreneurs just like you succeed in video content creation. Don't let your competition get ahead. Mark your calendar for March 1st and be among the first to get your hands on a copy of The One Right Video. Go to onerightvideo.com. And with that, let's get back into this week's episode. So specs are great on paper. Saving money is great, but that doesn't always quantify to still making a jump for some people from a seven and $800 camera body purchase. So that could have been an A6600, which is, was, uh, I think that was like $1,100 or something like that, $1,200. You have closer higher end cameras now that come out that are cinema style. Imagine like the, FX3 that I mentioned, that Netflix approved camera condensed down, squares, if you will, into the APS-C sensor size, completely brand new tech, all amazing stuff, but that's the FX30. FX30 is like $1,800. A7 IV, $2,500. And like I said, between the FX3 and the A7S Mark III, $35 to $4,000. Again, and also think about tax with that. Now you have this camera that puts all of those cameras to shame because how much are you saving with all of that? But again, that don't matter for a lot of people if they're coming from a seven, $800 camera. That is a, a ridiculous price jump from twenty from $800 to like 2,200, even a thousand to some, some degree to 2,200. It's crazy. And if you have lenses, great, great with the Sony E-mount, you have the one mount system, but here's my thing. You don't have to upgrade your lenses so much so you can use the clear and zoom to crop in on a little bit. I really don't care about all of that. My thing is what does this camera make possible? And for me, it was enough to switch to full frame and to say, you know what? Obviously I'm gonna keep my cameras and lenses and stuff or what have you, but it's not even thing, anything about the sensor size per se, like I spoke about earlier, because there's not any significant enough limitations you can find amazing creators that make beautiful content with any sensor size, but it, what, what it makes possible at the price point that it is and what it makes accessible to what will be relatively somewhat unskilled creators. So like think entry level stuff from like the ZVE 10 to make it easier to learn and stuff, brand new menu system, brand new touchscreen, amazing touchscreen features and functionalities. Some of that color grading and stuff, cropping the block, black bars and stuff you don't have to do. I'm not so much so interested in the black bars bit, but some of those extra, uh, for lack of a better, for a creative filters, if you will. Microphone headphone port, HDMI port, USB streaming, all body design that I love from the ZVE-10. If the, like there's no ZVE-10 upgrade that's going to come, that's going to match what this camera makes possible because I don't think it's gonna have potentially like the AI auto reframing and stuff. I would hope to be wrong always, cause then that's a win. You know, maybe it costs, the, the new ZV-10 Mark II cost $1,000. 
And maybe it has some of those things, but maybe it doesn't. I don't know. So they can't, I don't know. I can't really see them doing it, but I couldn't see them making a the ZBE one as good as they did also. But what it makes possible is saving time when recording stuff. If I want to make more dynamic shots, I don't have to have somebody hold the camera and try to tilt down or wind up making it into two different types of recordings or just getting frustrated enough to not do it. Whatever idea was and just like, it's going to take, sit this down, reframe this, make sure it's level, reposition the audio. Sometimes when you're behind the camera, it's like you may need to, depending on where you're at, it's like to get the better audio, you're flipping the mic around. So now the shotgun mic faces you. So you're not... Uh, crowding like the one that maybe you have on a lapel. It's just like all these micro inefficiencies have added up over time to if I was ever going to make a more significant upgrade to a camera, it has to do way better. For some people, I don't think this jump is going to make a whole lot of sense. But I do believe for a lot of entrepreneurs, serious content creating entrepreneurs, it will. I think it will make a lot of sense because the files, yeah, they may, will be larger, but they're better. They're better. Why wouldn't we want better? Why wouldn't we want the highest quality? And it's like, oh, this looks good enough. Yeah. ZV-10, AC-400, all this stuff looks great. Looks amazing. Love those cameras. We'll continue to recommend them. But when we think about like those clips of when I'm at Social Media Marketing World and had my friend, you know, he had his uh, cameras getting some clips on the ZV-10 uh, Sigma 16. You have to turn on active stabilization, which is wonky on the ZV-E10. So you have dynamic stabilization on the camera, the ZV-E1 now. So imagine having Sony Catalyst Browse, the highest end level, better than just IBIS, the built-in in-body image stabilization in a camera. You have like IBIS lens stabilization and Catalyst Browse making it amazing and no weird stuff in the corners where it feels like this snatching away. It looks awful. Absolutely awful. I did that in a vlog one time. It's the worst thing, worst decision ever. I've been scarred ever since. Can't use it. It's not usable. And I don't have faith that Sony's going to make decent stabilization, like in-body image stabilization for APS-C that won't be under $1,000. So it's not going to be, I don't, again, this is my thinking. It's not going to be like a ZV-E10 Mark II that is a $1,100 to $1,200 camera maybe and still match up to all the things of what this 12 megapixel Netflix approved sensor quality with AI functionality and a ton of other features that are literally in no other Sony cameras. It's sending riots online at this point. People saying I'm never buying another Sony flagship cameras. It's been a waste of money. They won't give us firmware updates. They're wrong for that. Don't get me wrong. Sony's wrong for that. But at the same time, this is an ideal camera purchase. What always made me hesitant about switching to full frame too, the lenses uh, are way more expensive and stuff gets way heavier. The camera's light, super duper light. Like I said, for a lot of people, the jump financially is a big determining factor. But I also look at how much more of my time am I wasting having to wait for Catalyst Browse. How much more am I going to have to pay my editor if I send him unstabilized footage and he now has to wait for Catalyst Browse to finish before he can even begin adding the parts in that he wants to edit or seeing how he needs to manipulate it or what he needs to do for that? How much time is it overall costing us for slower production? So other projects are falling behind because when you're waiting for a file, you had an intent date for it to publish. And so like right now we're creating a bunch of new content. And so we've gone through all of our um, old stuff and, you know, stuff we were going to record or whatever. Okay, well, now what? You know, it just becomes a very expensive thing. Sometimes, like I said, when you buy too cheaply, you also buy the problems that come with being cheap. And that phrase never becomes more true when you have a situation kind of like what's happening now where what was working and what was one of the better options based on affordability, based on features, functionalities, and all that. Like I said, like the ZV-10, I love that camera. It's fun to use. I will continue to use it. Uh, and so it'll still have a home in the office and all of that. But my daily driver is going to become that ZV-E1. Why? Because it cuts down on the time that we would need to fix stuff in post. So our efficiency as a team speeds up. 
my efficiency and my creative process. So I'm not wasting my own time speeds up. So now the thing that was a great bargain and a great buy and punch way above his weight class, which it still does. I don't have to buy a gimbal or think about gimbals anymore for vlogging, for creative content, for moving shots, for B-roll clips. If I handed the camera to somebody else while I'm talking to get B-roll clips, I wouldn't have to have to worry about how stable it is or just uh, oftentimes I'll just turn it off. So I know, know that I can use Catalyst Browse later. Don't have to think about that stuff anymore. Kind of in the same vein of me switching to Rode Wireless Go 2s to the DJI mics because I got to get my hands on them and I got to test them the last time I was out of town. And I was like, yeah, this is another one of those times where it's not just hype, like it's legit. So that's another change that's going to be happening. But I just wanted to kind of put all of this into like a podcast episode because I know there's going to be a lot of other frustrated, confused, concerned buyers. And like I said, sometimes people like well, will inch something out just solely based on price. I think you ought not think that way because that $2,200 can easily become so much more time and money that you lose over the course of creating for a year, six months, three months even, depending on what your productivity rate is on how fast you're able to crank out content and how fast your editor is able to get that stuff back. It'd be as close to right as possible and in a place that you can upload it, hit publish, get all the other bits of what is required for a video to hit publish on for you. That now becomes drastically faster, easier. One feature uh, that I think about is like something like user LUTs. We've uh, used a creative LUT um, that I just kind of liked uh, and occasionally seems like every t a year, two years, sometimes I'll switch up slightly or sometimes it's a little bit more drastically to what I like or, uh, you know, what look I want, what I want the vibe to feel like on the videos and stuff. And so the standard look of what you've been seeing uh, whether you're watching the video version of this podcast or watched regular videos in the last six months or so or longer um, on the regular YouTube channel, then that's been, you know, the vibe. We use a LUT for that. But now we have user LUTs that we can put on the camera. So we don't have to worry about adding an adjustment later, filtering some stuff in or whatever yet yeah, bakes it into the image. But we keep it pretty standard and it's very, very light. And whatever else we still want to add, we could. But now that process gets cut down tremendously. So this is the kind of stuff I think about when I'm going through the process of deciding, like, is this going to make a difference? And I'm not just talking about being hype and excited from camera because I thought the FX30 was going to be it. And I'm like, but let me wait and see what Sony's going to produce and what this is going to make possible. And if it's really going to be a big difference or not, or is it something that could wait? FX30, I'm like, I, I lost it. You would have thought the freaking Super Bowl happened. It didn't when the FX30 came out, but that's how it felt. Screaming, hollering, just like, oh, yes, so pumped when that camera came out because I'm like, this is my favorite. This, like, this is my ideal stuff that I would want in a camera. I didn't think the things that they put in the ZVE one were like we were in that time frame of it being impossible for them to do. It's like a want and a wish because it seems so far out, but they did it. So now I'm like, yeah, I could save a lot of money going with like people talking about the Panasonic S5 It's cheaper and it does this and it does that. It don't do what the ZVE one does. And for a lot of people concerned about the overheating tests that are being done, um, I don't really concern myself with that, not because it's like a blind faithfulness or something, which is ridiculous for anything, but the fact that, well, I won't say for anything, but it is a, for most things, <laughs> like blind faith is, is pretty stupid. But the thing is this, I've been with Sony long enough. I've been in the camera space long enough. I've been a creator long enough to know the relative patterns, patterns of how this is going to work. Yes, it's going to overheat initially. Yes, there'll be people that complain about it. So you'll see an increase in it. Then you'll see the firmware update come out and then people will retest it again. And then people, some people still say they're having issues, which depend on their region, what kind of work they do or whatever. But it's like, I promise you this, I ain't been in no rain. That's no rain, cold weather, snow. I ain't doing none of that. So weather selling on camera never bothered me about something. That's why I never, you know, it's like, it's good if it has it. I don't really care if it doesn't or don't because I'm not going to be in the rain. <laughs> That's one of those things. Um, if 90% of my videos are on a tripod or something similar, 
it's fine if it doesn't have the best stabilization. It only means that other 10% of different types of things, I would need to use Catalyst Browser or something like that, or give it to somebody else. Sometimes it's like knowing this is something that needs to be hired out to somebody that's going to use a Gimbal or whatever, but don't have to think about that stuff anymore. So $2,200 becomes a really, really, really cheap investment to solve a lot of current problems that because again, just for where we were in the market in 2020, 2019, even, and now what cameras are doing again, namely the ZVE one, that financial gap is not so much a big of a gap. And I don't care what the Panasonic S5 II does is a great camera. Whoever buys it, it's going to be, they probably don't have a lot of fun. If X30 is a great camera, whoever buys it, they're probably going to have a lot of fun and it will still solve a lot of problems for them, but not in the way and not as much as the ZVE-1 will for me. And knowing that we already know a firmware update is going to come, the AI in the camera that's new first on the map period in the camera space knows like Sony is the person that hates to lose. They're the team that hates to lose. So if they ever lose a game, they're going to work harder than they ever have before to make sure they never get embarrassed like that again. With the AI technology, we know that it's going to be one of those things where they're going to make sure they don't ever look a fool with this. Same thing with the overheating. The camera that does all this will have that resolved. If not by the date that it hits the, the, the pavement, essentially, very shortly there afterwards, which it camera drops in May of 2023. And then I think by June is the firmware update that's scheduled. I'm not worried about it. That's why I'm, that's why I can have comfort in knowing like I've been, I've watched enough brands, all of them go through where they have some kind of hiccups instantly fixed within 30 days of the camera hitting streets. It'll be fine. I don't know what temperatures some people are in or like you got potato jet puts it in the freaking microwave oven or who knows what with the easy bake oven. It's just like, I'm not doing all that. I promise you, if I'm, if I'm at risk of overheating, heating, the camera is not in a situation where it's at risk of overheating a videographer, filmmaker, or somebody doing wedding films or something like that. And the camera sitting in direct heat because of the venue that is it. That makes sense. I understand that. I'm not that person. Most entrepreneurs, we're not that person. You probably going to be in air conditioning. You don't want the pools of sweat under your arms and I don't either. So <laughs> I just, you know, I'm so excited about this camera. I'm so freaking excited about this camera. Of course, there will be videos on it and we will continue to make video content around the ZVE-1 as, as well as ZVE-10, as uh, ZV-1 and all the other cameras that make sense to helping entrepreneurs simplify the video creation process. But that is where I'm going to leave it for this week's episode. And as I love to end all of my episodes, the winds of life blows on us all, but it is how you set your sails. With that, guys, with passion, I'll see you on the next episode of the Video Simplified Podcast. Take care. Thanks for tuning into this week's episode, but the value doesn't stop there. For more in-depth trainings, courses, and growing your brand using video, join the Video Simplified community at videosimplified.live.